This is land who is Knip or land who is Knip is the most famous plantation house on the island. The name of the plantation Knip actually comes from the Knip tree which grows on the ground. The plantation house itself was built sometime in the early 1700s and it was one of the most prosperous plantations on the island. It produced sheep wool and DVD seed pods and the plantation was actually restored in 1985. The plantation was also the site of the island's first slave revolt. On the morning of August 17, 1795, under the leadership of a slave named Tula, about 40 to 50 slaves refused to work. The revolting slaves went to the nearby Santa Cruz plantation, freeing imprisoned slaves along the way. There they were joined by another rebel group, under the leadership of a slave named Bastian Carpata, and together managed to defeat a troop of Dutch soldiers. The revolt lasted just over a month, and over a thousand slaves participated, many of whom were killed by Dutch forces. The revolt finally ended on September 19, 1795, when Tula and Carpata were betrayed by a fellow slave. Them, along with other revolt leaders, were executed shortly after, but their struggle paved the way for other liberation movements on the island, and slavery was finally abolished in 1863. Tula is still revered on the island today, and his struggle is honored with a holiday every August 17th. His life and struggle were even portrayed in a 2013 movie starring Danny Glover, which was filmed right here on Curacao. Today, Tua's legacy lives on, and monuments to him stand all over the island. The adjacent museum named in his honor further illustrates his life and struggle, and graphically depicts the brutal treatment of the slaves he fought to free. In addition, the museum also depicts plantation life, and displays everyday artifacts that were brought over both by the Dutch and by African slaves. These include cooking oils and utensils, Dutch irons, and a traditional Dutch music box and laundry set. Most of the artifacts, however, are of African origin, and include a traditional calabash display, handmade dolls, hats, busts, and statuettes, traditional wooden drums, this beautiful African dress, and even a replica of a traditional West African hut. If your timing is right, you might even witness one of the museum guides playing the traditional Dutch music box, or doing a laundry demonstration while chanting a traditional African work song. This is Grote Knip, the most beautiful beach and also the most popular beach on the island. This is where most of the tourists and locals come to swim. And the Papiamento name for this beach is Playa Abu, which means the beach in the valley. And in fact, most signs you see for this beach actually say Playa Abu, so that's good to know so you don't get lost. This beach actually has many names, not just those two. It's also known as Playa Canepa, Playa Grande, Canepa Grande, or simply just Knip and Canepa. This beach, so beautiful, that was once voted the top beach in the Caribbean. One important thing to know about Curacao is that most of the island's beaches are either privately owned by hotels or charge a fee to use. And I heard that this fee can range anywhere from three to fifteen dollars but there are also a few free beaches on the island like this one that only charge for umbrellas and beach chairs but the actual beach is free so my advice to you is do a little research find out which beaches are free and just stick to those beaches as I was walking around over here I saw some small fish a lot of them actually so Good thing I brought my snorkel gear with me. I'm gonna head down there and take a closer look. Guys, have a look at this. All this debris we see around us is actually the remnants of what was once a spectacular coral reef. The destruction is the result of Hurricane Omar, which struck the island in 2008. Oh, 
check this area out now and see if there's some good snorkeling over here. Check this out. Right in front of us we have a school of yellow goldfish. These small fish are found throughout the warm waters of the Atlantic Ocean, mainly in the Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean Sea, but range as far as the Cape Verde Islands. At night they're solitary creatures, but during the day they hunt in large schools such as this and use their small whiskers to rifle through sand and sediment in search of prey, which mostly consists of smaller fish. One of those places where everyone was staying in the car. So far we've managed to get around just fine without a car using buses, taxis and private drivers and the best part about that is that you get to travel with the locals and you also get to meet people. We actually made friends with a local cab driver and he sort of became our cab driver for the rest of our time here and we sort of feel like we've known each other for years. For me that's what travel is all about and those are the kinds of experiences you miss out on if you rent a car. So my advice to you is don't rent a car and just use the public bus system. This mountain you see behind me is the island's famous mountain, Christophel. It's about 1,230 feet high and is the highest mountain in the ABC Islands. Most locals know it by its Dutch name, Christophelberg. Oh, oh wow. Now we have two Caribbean parakeets right there. Oh wow. Behind me you can see the ruins of the Zorgvild plantation, which was built sometime in the 18th century. The reason this plantation house is in ruins is because it was actually destroyed during a slave rebellion in 1775 and they never bothered to rebuild it. I can only imagine what it looked like before it became a ruin. This enormous pillar you see right here is a slave pole and this is where the slaves would be tied up and the slave master would then whip them if he didn't agree with something they did or if he didn't think they were working hard enough. Right here we have the ruins of the house of the bomba and no bomba is not a European word for bomb but in this case the bomba was actually the slave who was in charge of the other slaves. This building behind me is the Landhui Savonet. It was one of the first plantation houses to be built on the island. It was built in 1662 by Matthias Beck who was deputy director of the West India Company. 
In its heydays, the plantation supplied the Dutch with everything from wool, maize, pulses, aloe, cotton, meat, and wood. But its main product was the indigo plant, which was soaked and fermented to produce dye. But in the mid-19th century, the plantation turned to livestock. In 1806, it was set on fire by the English during the British invasion of the island, but was shortly restored to its original condition, and continued operations until the abolition of slavery. It now houses a museum. Artifacts include traditional West African headdresses, artifacts from the island's original inhabitants, the Amerindian, beautiful seashells, Dutch porcelain including these unique plates, cups, statuettes and baby decor, cooking implements, these fancy bottles, old books and maps, old farming tools, old weaponry like these rifles and swords, old pottery and calabash displays, milk churns, and these woven straw hats and handbags. In addition, the museum also contains some of the island's creepier artifacts, like this religious altar and this very creepy coffin. Check this out, they even had TVs back then. This is what the slaves would do after work. We just got the first rain we've had in days. And this is supposed to be the dry season. It's my last full day here on Curacao and I've come to Playa Lagoon. This is supposed to be the best snorkeling spot on the island. So I'm gonna end my journey with some snorkeling. Whoa, guys, take a look at this. This is absolutely incredible. This massive school of fish along the edge of the cliffs indicates that spawning season here in the Caribbean. Spawning season usually begins in the spring and ends in the fall, but the highest spawning occurs in midsummer, during which time many fish species will come into the shallow water along the edge of the reef to mate and lay their eggs, sometimes gathering in the hundreds. What a remarkable sight. I can't wait to see what else we find down here. That fish right there is a banded butterfly fish. They're a popular pet in saltwater aquariums as they get along well with other reef fish, often even acting as cleaner fish. But their calm nature makes them very vulnerable to large predators. These strange looking fish we see all around us are ballyhoo. They're a type of needlefish which are named for their long slender bodies. They usually grow no longer than 16 inches, though the longest on the record was around 21 inches. They love to hang out above sandy bottoms and often skim the surface of the water to avoid predators. Is one of the many species of parrotfish found in the ocean. These strange looking creatures we see in front of us aren't fish but a school of Caribbean reef squid. The size of these squid tells me they're adults which are usually found in much deeper water. However, we're just below the surface here which tells me that these squid are in the middle of breeding season. Marine biologists have discovered that this particular species of squid actually change color, shape, and texture as a form of communication. But like all squid, they have the ability to shoot ink when threatened. So I think it's best if we leave these animals be and see what other interesting things we can find.
Guys, have a look at this. At first glance, this may look like some sort of plant or stick, but it's actually a living fish called a trumpet fish. It spends most of its day standing on its head, trying to blend in with the surrounding coral as it waits to ambush its prey, which mainly consists of small fish and crustaceans. Guys, right below us we have what's called a cleaning station. That juvenile French angelfish is actually eating tiny parasites off those larger fish. That large mass of tentacles we see right there is not a plant, but a living creature called a sea anemone. It's closely related to corals and jellyfish, and uses its long poisonous tentacles to both capture small prey and protect itself from predators. Wow, what a beautiful spot to end my journey. I'm better than you. I'm a queen, you're a fool. I'm a drum, you're a fool. You'll never be this fool. Bravo. Free Curacao Entertainment. <laughs> Bye. Before I came to Curacao, I thought that the island would be a lot like Aruba, but it's completely different. Aruba had an equal mix of both Dutch and American tourists, while well, here I almost only saw Dutch tourists. In Aruba, most of the population speaks English. Here on Curacao, a lot of people don't speak English. On Aruba, the people were a lot more open, friendlier, and cheerful, while here on Curacao, the people are a bit closed off and lose their temper easily. But I did like that the island was very hassle-free, and there were no annoying hawkers or street vendors. As for the landscape and historical sites, Curacao is the most interesting of all the ABC islands. Then there was Bonaire, which I thought felt a bit American, but also a bit Latino as well. But by far my favorite experience from both islands were all the amazing friends we made along the way. And sometimes those experiences are more memorable than the sights you see.